We're back to the Total Education Celebrity Show on the Total Education Network, TotalTutor.net for more information. Twitter, Total Tutor, Neil S. Haley, Facebook, uh, the Beach Lifestyle Celebrity Segment. And I, I tell you what, uh, this uh, NBA player story is fantastic. And, and I, I've been having a lot of uh, great stories of NFL players, but I tell you, resiliency, the ability that who would have thought he would end up in the NBA and then have such a great career and then on to entrepreneurship and helping others. A lot, a lot of fun things we're going to talk about. So I want to welcome the program, former NBA player Harvey Catchings. Harvey, thanks for calling. Thanks a lot for having me, Neil. I'm actually looking forward to this, and I've been looking forward for the last couple of weeks. Well, that's an honor to be. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you, especially. I mean, just to talk about specifically how you have been able to transform people's lives. Had a great career. Your daughter, the famous WNBA player. So you've just you just uh, really have had a, a, an unbelievable life, haven't you? Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, God just continues to keep on giving and blessing, you know, and and that's one of the things that I've found throughout my life that you know it's always better to give than to receive. Than to, than to receive. And being involved with an organization like Project Wet has truly, truly been a blessing for me. And absolutely, we're going to talk about that in the second segment. It's about your career in the first, and then we'll all about Project Wet in the second. And I'm so glad that uh, that learn about the stuff, and definitely have you on quarterly to give us some updates. But uh, Harvey, growing up, did you think you were going to be a, a basketball player? Not at all, did you? Well, you know what's amazing is that uh, I didn't play but eight games in high school. You now, oh my, I, 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 at, at six feet six inches tall. Believe it or not, I played in the marching band and also the concert band. And so needless to say, uh, I was not very well liked around the school because I was probably the biggest guy in the school, uh, but, you know, just did not like sports. So you never had that inkling to want to be on the basketball floor. So you play eight uh, games pretty much. And uh, how did that lead to <laughs> this in- interesting story? Uh, for sure, I, it just didn't come easy. To, <laughs> it, it, it didn't come easy, did it, Harvey? Uh, Not at all. I had an aunt that worked out at UCLA, and she knew Benny Crum and uh, John Wooten. She invited me out there one summer to, you know, to to introduce them to me. And uh, believe it or not, I worked out for uh, Benny. And at the time, I was always able to run and jump, Neil, but I never really had the kind of coordination that was needed. Uh, in order for me to be a well-rounded basketball player. Let me let me put it this way. Uh, after my high school year was over, I went to Jackson State because I'm from Jackson, Mississippi, and I spoke to uh, Coach Paul Covington about a potential scholarship. And he told me very, very bluntly, he, son, he said, son, we recruit athletes. So that let me know right then and there that, that this was probably a stage that I would not have an opportunity to uh, play on. But once I went out to UCLA, met Denny Prom, he had a friend at Weatherford Junior College, uh, Coach Bill McDonald, uh, that gave me an opportunity to come and try out and, you know, gave me a scholarship. And from there, the rest is history. A lot, a, a tremendous amount of hard work because the skill level, as you probably would recognize, was probably at a, at a pretty rough level. So basically, when you knew you didn't have a shot, you you or got. I guess you had to say, well, you must have started liking basketball if you went through this process. You went and kind of uh, did your own recruiting of teams and, and conversations with people like Coach Crum and John Wooden, and then also uh, your local team. And it just seemed like you just didn't have the athleticism. So you went to junior college, and there is where you kind of started the process of becoming more athletic in basketball, right? Exactly. And also, the, the other thing that was interesting about that, the whole thing that led up to that was that I didn't want my parents to have to pay for me to go to college. So I was looking for every opportunity that I could, you know, to take advantage of it. Obviously, coming in raw like that, you never have those delusions of grandeur that, oh, yeah, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to play in the NBA and I'm going to have an opportunity to play 11 years and, you know, travel all over the world and do all of these things. And, you know, obviously that never came into a dream that I ever had. I just basically wanted to be able to get my degree so that I could 
you know, evolve and do some other things. And so, again, uh, a really good story in a way that you're, you were looking at acad- academics, not athletics. You wanted athletics to lead to academics, lead to success, and to become who you wanted to be. So you had that entrepreneurial spirit in certain ways, kind of investigating, doing certain things. So in junior college, you kind of you got taller. So, you, you know, you were 6'6", six, six and people were like, oh, I'm not interested in this. But once you became 6'9", and you started learning how to play the game, things changed, didn't it? It was a whole different ball game. I um, uh, ended up having a successful year in junior college. Uh, by the time by the time the year ended, uh, West Virginia College decided that they no longer wanted to have a sports program. So we were kind of on our own to find out what our next steps would be. So once colleges started finding out that um, you know that I was um, available, I probably had over a hundred scholarships to different schools. In fact, I actually signed a letter uh, of, of uh, intent to the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. I went out there, decided that I really didn't like the way things were going. And uh, one of the people that I had met throughout the recruiting process, the name was Glenn Whitus. At the time, he was at Howard Payne College, and I really didn't want to go to a Division II school. I really wanted to try to go to Division I. So once I went out to the University of New Mexico and decided that that's not where I wanted to be now, I called this coach and said, you know what, coach, I really don't want to be here. And he said, you know, the thing that's amazing is that I have been offered a coaching opportunity at Hardin Simmons University. And Hardin Simmons was Division One, so that's all I needed. You know, yeah, it was only 1,800 students, but at the end of the day, it gave me an opportunity to, you know, play on that Division One level. So you went ahead and took the shot. You got your scholarship. You went uh, throughout. When did you know that you might be an NBA player? Did you kind of – when is finally said, you know what, I'm 6'9 now and I'm learning the game and, and this seems like I might be able to play in the next level? After my sophomore year at Hardin Simmons, I, I, you know, uh, I mean, I had, I had a very good year there as well, and I got drafted by the Carolina Cougars of the ABA my sophomore year. And that's when I started thinking, well, you know what, maybe there is – something to this dream, you know, that I might, you know, be able to play at that next level. And it actually caused me to work that much harder, Neil. And so after my sophomore year, I got drafted my junior year. I also got drafted my junior year by Philadelphia. And I decided, you know what, there was no money at that time. Well, there was no money when I eventually came out anyway. <laughs> but but definitely in my junior year, there was no money. So I stayed my senior year, and then I ended up being drafted by the Philadelphia 76ers in the third round of the 1974 draft. And I tell you what, that was probably one of the greatest moments of my life uh, was being drafted. But it really came to fruition after I went through training camp and on a bus ride back from an exhibition game, uh, sitting next to Gene Shu, he told me that I had made the team. And that was, man, I, I can't even tell you how exciting that was. So even being drafted, Harvey, you didn't know for sure you'd make, make the basketball team, it sounds like. It was, not at all. It was not a guarantee. Not at all. No. So. Because uh, Marvin Barnes had been drafted number one in the draft. And I knew that, I mean, he was a guy that everybody wanted. Uh, Philadelphia was able to draft him, and we, pay, and we played the same position. So I was like, well, you know what? It was great being drafted. I mean, that's why I said it was a highlight. Uh, but when he decided to go to the ABA, and that opened up a whole different ball game for me because the other centers that we had, Leroy Ellis and Clyde Mays, you know, they were older guys that were at the end of their career. And uh, that actually gave me an opportunity to, you know, showcase my skills and uh, have an opportunity to play uh, 
in front of Jiggy Shoe. All right, we're talking to Harvey Catchings, uh, former NBA player and much, much more, doing a lot of work with Project Wet and look forward to talking about that in the next segment. And Harvey's been telling us about a career of resiliency, not giving up, going after your dream. And it, it, it came once you made the team. You said, you know what, I'm not leaving the NBA. Once I made the NBA, there's no way you're going to take me out. So what kind of uh, training regiment did you have? What kind of uh, different game plan did you have to say, you know what, I'm going to stay the course? Because a lot of people go in the NBA, they play a couple of years, and they're gone. What made you say, you know what, I, 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 know I want to continue to play in this game and to improve and become better? Probably the best conversation that I had, uh, you know, after I knew that I had made the team was with Jimmy Shue. When I came in, you know, I was averaging, averaging close to 20 points a game in college, 11 rebounds, three or four blocks a game. So, you know, people take a look at that and they say, wow, you know, that, you know, nice, decent career. Coming into the NBA, I'm thinking, okay, well, I'll be able to come in. I won't be able to average 15 to 20 points a game. But if I can average like, you know, 10, 12 points here or there, you know, uh, eight, nine rebounds because, you know, you're, you're at the highest level possible. Uh, I said, you know, I can do very well. Yang Shu sat down with me. He said, Harvey, he said, this is what I want from you. He said, we have Doug Collins, we have George McGinnis, we have Billy Cunningham, we have Fred Carter. These are all offensive players. And this, their job <laughs> is to put the ball in the basket. He said, all I want from you is to rebound the basketball play defense, block shots, and do the little things that will make a good team a very good team. So needless to say, Neil, somebody comes at you and says, wait a minute, you know, why would you draft me if you're not going to give me an opportunity to shoot? Because, you know, that was the name of the game. You know, scoring and having all the accolades and, you know, making all the money and everything. And now I'm in a situation where you're going to take that part of my game away? And he says, those are the things that will allow you to hang around in this league for a very long time. Because let me explain to you this. If you come in as an offensive player, there are defenses designed to keep you from scoring a lot of points. If that's all you can do is shoot the basketball, you'll see guys that will come in, they'll play a couple of years, but then they're gone. They're gone because they can't do the other things that will help the team win. So after having that conversation, Neil, and realizing that, you know what, he's the one writing the check. <laughs> I've got to give him what I want, you know, what he wants. And, and that's the thing that I try to, when I talk to kids today, I say, you know what, find out what a coach wants from you. Yes. You might come in and say, okay, I want to do this, and I want to do that, and that. And the team doesn't need that. I said, find out what the coach wants, find out what the team needs, and then give the team that, and then – you know, you'd be able to be successful on several fronts. And so as a result, I never averaged more than five, six points a game in the NBA. And people laugh at, you know, they say, oh, man, wait a minute, how did you hang around and you only, you know, average, you know, three points this year and two and a half and four, you know, how did you do that? I said, if you take a look at the other things that I did, that's the reason I was able uh -huh. to stay in the league. Because, you know, every year, you and I both know they draft centers. Yes. They draft guys that are high profile to come through. And at the end of training camp, I was still standing. <laughs> Eleven years later, I was still standing. So uh, it really gave me the impetus to really uh, put my life together and, and, and just come out and say, if you work hard and you work consistent, and you stay on top of your game, getting better and better year after year, you'll be able to hang around not only in sports, but also in life, doing exactly, whatever yes. you want to do. Absolutely. You know, let's take a look. Yeah, definitely, Harvey. And it's something that's amazing. And it taught you in your business career as well. So I understand as we get back, we'll go a little bit more into this and then right into Project Wet because of your experience with Don Nelson and the Milwaukee Bucks. That was your, I guess, your highlights of your career where you really, uh, your game was going. You had a great team you were playing with and you learned so much from him. All right, when we get back more with Harvey Catchings from the NBA and much, much more. You're listening to Told Education Celebrity Show on the Told Education Network, and we'll be back in just a moment. 
We're back to the Total Education Celebrity Show on the Total Education Network, TotalTutor.net for more information. Twitter, Total Tutor, Neil S. Haley, Facebook, and I'm with Harvey Ketchings, 11-year veteran from the NBA. Fantastic career. And when I now remember who you were, it was when you played with the Milwaukee Bucks. Because I, I tell you, that was with Don Nelson. And Don Nelson's a character every place he coached, wasn't he? <laughs> Don Nelson. You know, you talk about players coach. You talk about coaches that impact the game because they have the ability to get inside of your head and get you to do things that you might not necessarily want to do. But, you know, he knows that it's good for the team. And being able to play in Milwaukee for five years was incredible because every year he had a great season. He didn't get over the hop uh, to win it all. We were always in postseason play. Uh, we always won our division. Uh, we got to the uh, championship finals uh, uh, one year. Uh, but I tell you, uh, it was it was attributed to the system that Nelly had in place in Milwaukee. And his system's unlike any other system in the NBA ever sees. I mean, remember his career with, uh, I remember more Golden State based on my age, but I remember Milwaukee as well. And specifically, your height is perfect for that type of system, to be a center in a system where you have to be pretty short and you got to be able to run the floor for sure. Yeah, exactly. And that's one of the things that I always worked hard at, uh, coming into training camp in shape, making sure that, uh, I was able to outrun guys because that was the philosophy that we had at Milwaukee going into training camp and coming out of training camp, going into the exhibition season. We always knew that as a team, psychologically, it was better for us to be in tip-top shape because a lot of teams were trying to get their key players in shape. So, you know, you would actually end up still in a few games early that you may not – you know, may not have had an opportunity to win uh, had you just not been in better shape. Well, absolutely. So you had that successful career. You become uh, in. You're involved in business, but now why Project Wet? Uh, uh, because uh, the situation is, uh, you had a great career. You're busy uh, working and and successful in your career, but yet you still want to give back. Tell us why this. Why Project Wet? A couple of years ago, uh, they came into the Houston area to do a water project. And um, we had an opportunity to get 15 of our guys to come out and be a part of water education, ed- education educating kids on why it's important to, you know, use less water to brush your teeth, use less water and taking a shower, uh, water conservation, making sure that um, you were educated about the fact that there's absolutely nothing that we can do without that resource. Uh, the fact that they've been around since 1984, and their mission is to reach children, parents, educators, and communities with water education to ensure a sustainable planet. But here's the thing that's incredible about them, Neil, is the fact that they have um, that they have programs not only in all 50 states in this country, but we also have programs in 60 countries. Wow! I've had opportunity. You know, I haven't had an opportunity to go on the mission trips yet. But some of the other board members, uh, and, and I am on their national board. But some of the other board members that I've spoken with said, you won't truly be able to appreciate just how dynamic this organization is until you have an opportunity to see the respect that they're given in all these different countries that they're a part of. Because you got to keep in mind, everything that we take for granted here, Neil, people over there, they look at it as a luxury. Exactly. I mean, just the fact of being able to have clean water, just the fact of being able to have the different programs in place that we provide. I mean, it's just it's just unbelievable. You know, you talk about being an athlete, and, you know, what would we do without water? 
Right. You know, when you, when you go out and you sweat, you know, now, you know, you've got to replenish, you know, though, you know, you got to replenish yourself. Water is critical when you start talking about uh, the process of making sure that your body is running at a maximum level. And I got to tell you, I mean, this, you know, Project Wet has really opened my eyes. And, you know, we're looking for partners throughout the country and actually throughout the world for a lot of the different programs that we have on right now, especially a program that we have called Urban Water that takes you right into the neighborhoods where it's truly needed uh, to be able to educate kids and be able to work with the administrations in those areas to refine our program so that, you know, people are understanding just how important it is for them to stay on task and, and, and respect the planet. So, Harvey, when you learned about the organization, it really, you said, I got to be involved in this, especially being involved with the NBA still, and especially the retired players and saying, you know what, people need to learn about this. They have to understand this. And that you also talked about that connection uh, between athletics and water in a way that water is so important to keep you uh rejuvenate you and keep you going. Without water, you can't play basketball. Without water, you can't survive. And if we learn ways of conserving water, it's going to be key, especially in global areas where, you know, water's not a uh, valuable resource. It's valuable, but yet it's, there's there's so little of it. And, And you know, the other thing, you know, the fact that when you start talking about the STEM program, science, technology, engineering, and math, that ties right into the water programs as well. Over the course of the next 10, 15, 20 years, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of jobs and careers that are going to come out of this particular industry. And Kids are going to be able to touch and feel and be a part of the progression of, um, you know, moving this to a whole different level. I mean, and, and that's exciting for me because, you know, you take a look around. You know, I've got a, I mean, you know, most of my kids are adults, but I also have a 13-year-old. And to know coming out of high school and coming out of college that here is an area that has not even been defined yet. But you know that over the course of the next few years, that with this urban waters program, which I think is just going to be incredible, uh, there are going to be uh, career opportunities there that kids are, are not even aware of today. And why do you think that is? That, that's a good question. I mean, I mean Harvey, I, I, we all know, you know that water is an important resource. We all know that Again, we don't utilize water in the right way. But why are you seeing this as something when we're talking about technology growth and things like that? This is going to be something the kids can be involved with in so many ways that's going to be another opportunity for work. Why is that? What, what, what is your thought? So when, you, when you think about the, the vast field of engineering, you know, I mean, engineers are going to be definitely needed. You know, every... Every construction job that's done, guess what? <laughs> they have to use some yes, form of water. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now you're talking about going into an industry where you'll be able to uh, design and build and engineer any type of project that, um, you know, I mean, that's imaginable. And you're going to need people in those particular situations that have the educational background to be able to, you know, to, to uh, advance and, and, and do those types of things. So it's going, to be, it's going to be incredible. So you feel in this global movement, uh, especially with Project What, that, again, with our uh, – we're lo- not having the ability to find water in certain areas that – we're, as technology, we're going to be, become so global that we're going to look at these third world countries and really try to make them from developing countries to really industrialized countries, and water's the first step. Exactly. 
And, and so what? how can our listeners out there help you out in Project WET? And I think that, and, and especially your initiatives, because the more educated we get, the more we understand we have to be a global society to help others all over the world, not just at home. The funny thing about this is that it's actually going to start at the educational level where we have teachers in the field that will use some of the publications. You know, we have over 50 publications that address water usage and, and how it works into our culture. We have over 300 different science methods. We have activity books. We have education guides for teachers, you know, teacher training. Uh, we can even customize program. Uh, I was talking to uh, one of our coordinators earlier, Nicole Ritter, and we were talking about the fact that if a, if a corporation wanted to have their own publication, that they would be able to give out in mass across the country, across the world, that would give them a footprint in this, you know, in, in this industry as well. We have the ability to design those types of programs and tie those into Project Wet. That's amazing. It absolutely yeah, I mean, is. Yeah, and and I want to help out. I, like I said, I'm going to invite you back in, in three months to tell us more about the project. You and I will break it down education-wise more. You know, we got to know who Harvey Catching is, Catchings is and how you're understanding the involvement of Project WET. But we need to find ways to find more teachers that are going to be part of this, more schools that do uh, programs regarding this and so that we get the word out that we got to conserve our water harvey and we got to make exactly. sure that the whole world gets it not just you know we, we take it for granted in so many ways and then it's going to lead to kids loving science more engineering and really helping this stem movement so uh where can we find information harvey on project wet and more information on you as well our website is called discover water.org again that's discover water at org you can visit with a child or, or or with the teacher on on the site as well the way that we have it structured uh, you can attend the 2014 sustaining the blue planet global water education conference in big sky montana and that's from june 24th through 27th in 2014. That is going to be huge, Neil. Yes. I mean, that is going to be an, an incredible platform. If, if, I'm, if I'm corporate America, I'm thinking, how can we align ourselves with an organization that has global appeal? Exactly. You know, one, you know, one, 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 of, the, one of the most, and, and, and I found this, uh, I was in the promotion industry for a while, and what I found, Neil, is you you hitch your wagon to organizations that are already doing things that you believe in. And so this gives corporate America, this gives other organizations out there that, you know, might possibly even be nonprofit organizations that are looking to move over into this particular segment. It gives them, them an opportunity as well. But the website for this Blue Planet Global Water Education Conference is project.org backslash blue planet. Okay. Well, Har- and, then the last, and then the last way is to connect with Project Wet on Facebook. We even have Facebook and we have Twitter. You know, and from there you can learn about all the different workshops, projects, and also cool water facts and more. Well, I... I will absolutely be tweeting it out, uh, Harvey, Facebooking, promoting our interview, and looking forward to having you back in January to talk more about let's promote the big event. Let's uh, stay in touch in ways and figure out ways that we can really involve education all over the world in my global connections. And we definitely have to talk off air, and, and especially with Nicole, on ways how we can help each other out. So I appreciate you calling, Harvey, and please stay on the line because I remember we want to talk about some other stuff after this. So thanks for calling. That sounds great. Mary, you're a great guy. I really appreciate this platform, man. That's, 
you know what, that's what life is all about, opportunity. And we thank you very, very much for giving us this opportunity. You're welcome. You're listening to Education Celebrity Show, powered by the Beach Lifestyle Celebrity Segment, and we'll be back in just a moment.